President. <laughs> Senator from Ohio. First, I want to offer uh, my congratulations to Brent Stewart, and uh, that was a beautiful speech about the public service that he has uh, contributed to Wyoming and, and to uh, the United States Senate. Uh, so I thank uh, my colleague from Wyoming for that. Also want to say that over the weekend, um, I had the opportunity to travel to Kentucky. I live in Ohio, so um, Kentucky's our neighboring state, and went down to help some of our neighbors uh, get back on their feet after these devastating tornadoes. And uh, it was very emotional, uh, partly obviously seeing people's lives uh, just be devastated, so houses uh, ruined and family heirlooms lost and, and unfortunately some loss of life um, through the, as the tornado hit some of the uh, residential areas uh, in western Kentucky. But also uh, another emotion, which is gratitude for the people who came forward as volunteers to help, neighbor helping neighbor, as always happens. Uh, when you have one of these natural disasters, uh, the only silver lining is that people do come together and uh, providing water and food and uh, help getting people uh, out of their, their homes through urban search and rescue teams like Ohio Task Force One, who went down to Kentucky, uh, chainsawing uh, trees down so that people can get their cars out and, and uh, trying to repair some of, some of the damage, get their lives back together. So it was, uh, it was a terrible thing to see the devastation, but also a wonderful thing to see people coming together to help one another to get through a tough time. I'm on the floor today uh, primarily to talk about the legislation that has been proposed uh, by the Biden administration and by the Democratic leadership. This is uh, the 11th consecutive week that I've come to the floor to talk about this because uh, every uh, week since it was introduced 11 weeks ago, I wanted to talk about what's actually in this legislation, how it would impact our communities, how it would impact our, our economy. Uh, so today I'm, I'm here to talk a little about some of the new numbers we have in terms of inflation and how this would impact inflation. and some of the new numbers that just came out since last week from the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan group up here that analyzes these legislative efforts and what they are saying about what the cost of this bill will be. So I think it's worth having this conversation before Congress, uh, Senate, and the House uh, vote on this massive tax bill, massive spending bill that could fundamentally change the way our economy works and, and, and I think put us in a very difficult position as it relates to inflation and the economy and our debt and our deficit. Uh, Democrats want to push this through uh, under what's called reconciliation, which is a special procedure here in the Senate where instead of getting the normal supermajority of 60 votes, they could do it with only 50 votes and then have a tiebreaker be uh, the vice president in, in her role as president of the Senate. So uh, I have concerns about the substance of the legislation, but also in terms of the process, wouldn't it be great if this could actually go through committees and the committees could vet some of these proposals. Uh, last week I talked about some of the tax proposals, for instance, which I think have inadvertent impacts on pensions, uh, defined benefit plans in particular, uh, inadvertent effects on businesses that aren't going to be able to write off expansions of plant and equipment, which we want them to do. Uh, maybe some of these things are inadvertent, but it also has a change in the tax policy where it says that the state and local tax deduction would no longer be capped at $10,000. This is a federal deduction people were able to take for their state and local taxes, but they'd raise that to 80,000, that cap. The impact of that and a couple other things in the legislation means that 70% of millionaires, people that make over a million dollars in income a year, would get a significant tax cut under this legislation. Whereas if you only make 30,000 bucks a year, uh, only 30% of those people get a tax cut. And uh, and that's in the first year. And there's a second year it goes down to um, about half that. And in the third year it goes down to 10% and below. So it really is skewed toward providing tax relief for the wealthy at a time when obviously, you know, we're concerned about those people 
given the economic uncertainty, given the COVID issues, given the natural disasters, given the other issues that we face, you would want to help those who need the help the most. That's not what this legislation does. And again, if it had gone through the process of the committees of jurisdiction, in this case the Finance Committee, Ways and Means Committee, I don't think we'd be seeing this. All these issues are ones that could have been ironed out had it not been jammed through on this reconciliation process without any committee consideration. So I'm upset that Congress is being uh, thwarted from doing its work. And I think if we had, it would be a very different piece of legislation. This plan is also going to hurt, in my view, with regard to inflation. We're looking at the highest inflation we've had in decades. Uh, I think everybody knows that now, not because they're looking at the numbers, which I'll talk about in a second, but because when they go to the grocery store, uh, they're paying a lot more for hamburger or for milk or for bread. Um, or when they go to fill up their car with gas, uh, they're seeing the prices at the pump. I filled up my pickup truck. I took it to Kentucky on this trip I just talked about, um, and it was almost 100 bucks to fill it up. That's a lot for people who are on fixed income or young people or someone that's got to commute to work. That really takes, takes a bite out of your budget. Uh, but it's, that inflation is across our economy right now, and it's tough on people. Um, the work shortages uh, that we see, the workforce shortages, the supply chain delays, the inflation, all these things are problems in our economy right now. All of them get worse, in my view, if we do it the way the Democrats propose, because by adding more fuel to the fire, more stimulus spending, in this case trillions of dollars, uh, you're going to stimulate more demand in the economy. And inflation happens when demand outstrips supply. You know, so you have a lot of demand for something, but you don't have the supply for it, and it raises inflation. And that's exactly what many of us predicted would have happened back in March of this year when Congress did the same thing. $1.9 trillion, a lot of it was stimulus spending. And it, people said this is going to cause inflation. And sure enough, it did. And it wasn't just me and other Republicans. It was some Democrats as well. So that trend of rising inflation, which has made things so costly and expensive for so many people in my home state of Ohio, uh, shows no sign of slowing down. Late last week, the Labor Department reported the Consumer Price Index, CPA, uh, the CPI, rose by 6.8% over the last 12 months. That is the biggest year-to-year -year inflationary increase in 39 years, 39 years. And last month, the number for inflation, one month alone, was 0.8%. So get on your calculator, do the math, 0.8% in one month, do that times 12 months, you end up with inflation um, of 10% on an annualized basis. That's just from last month. If you just extrapolate that out over the year, 10% inflation? For those uh, who lived through inflation in the late 1970s, early 1980s, you know what that does to your economy. So the notion that the uh, Biden administration has this is going to be temporary or transitory, uh, that's just not true. And by the way, the Federal Reserve uh, has now said that's not true. It's, it's going to be here for a while. Um, Although we're hearing a lot of stories these days about businesses paying higher wages to attract workers, average wages went up by 4.3% last year. So with all the labor shortages and the increase in wages, wages went up 4.3%. Again, inflation went up 6.8% in the same 12-month period. So this is why if you're getting a raise at work, you feel pretty good about it. Um, getting the raise, but then you go to the grocery store or go to the gas pump or buy some clothes, you don't feel so good about it it's because your inflation is higher than your wage gain. So unless your wage gain is over 6.8% over the last year, on average, you're losing out. And that's, that's a real problem. By the way, in 2020, as we got into the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, we had a very different economy. In February of 2020, we had the 19th straight month of wage gains of 3% or more, and inflation was, you know, 1, 1 1.5%. So people were feeling it, which was, hey, I'm making more money, and it's not being eaten up by inflation. That's not the case now, unfortunately. Wages aren't keeping pace with these higher prices, and people are finding their paychecks just don't go as far as they used to. We can see by uh, some data that just came out from a survey of consumer expectations from the New York Fed, 
that an increasing number of people are reporting that they're struggling more financially than they did a year ago. That's from the Fed, the New York Fed. And fewer are expecting their financial situation to improve by this time next year. That's not a great feeling as we approach the holiday season. That's a real concern. The other report we've had since I was on the floor last week is with regard to the producer price index. We talked about the consumer price index. The producer price index is about businesses. What are businesses seeing in terms of inflation on business-to-business -business purchases, for instance? The new number out this week on that uh, is the largest increase year over year since we started keeping track of this number, which is about 11 years ago, 12 years ago. So the producer price index is also going up, and the consumer price index is already up. What this means is that that producer price index number is eventually going to be reflected in higher consumer costs, right? Because businesses are going to pass that along. So this is not a good, this is not a good week because we just got that data. And uh, I was very sorry to see it because what you want to see is that producer price index going down, meaning that in the future the consumer prices are going to go down too. Instead, we're, we're seeing a situation where it's likely that prices are going to keep going up. Again, Republicans warned of this when the $1.9 trillion was spent mostly to stimulate the economy, saying this is going to overheat the economy, more demand, less supply, partly because of COVID. In other words, COVID made it harder to get supply in. Demand was up. You're going to have inflation. Sure enough, it's what happened. Larry Summers is the former Secretary of the Treasury um, under President Obama, um, former chair of the National Council of Economic Advisors. Um, Actually, he was uh, Treasury Secretary for President Clinton, Chair of the National Economic Council for President Obama, respected uh, economist. Uh, he, too, warned of this. So it's not just a partisan issue, not Republicans and Democrats. It's, it's the reality. What's happening when you increase demand much more than supply can handle? You get inflation. So it's not a surprise that it happened. Unfortunately, his prediction came true. Overheated economy, demand outstripping supply, we found ourselves in this spiral of rising prices. That was nine months ago. I think it's fair to say that the inflation that people said was transitory is going to stay here for a while. That's a real cause for concern. So why are we doing this? <laughs> why are we, again, spending trillions of dollars? And what is the cost? Uh, something that happened since we talked last week is that the true cost of the Build Back Better plan is now being revealed by this uh, group on the outside. Uh, from the University of Pennsylvania to the Wharton School, by the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, by others, but now by the Congressional Budget Office itself. So the Congressional Budget Office is the nonpartisan group up here in Congress who tells us what the fiscal impact is, spending impact, taxing in impact is, economic impact is of legislation. And, you know, the number that has been cited for the cost of this Build Back Better legislation is $1.7 trillion over 10 years. That's a lot. <laughs> That would make it the second most expensive bill ever passed by Congress, the first being the $1.9 trillion we talked about in March. But it's worse than that uh, because it turns out that even those staggeringly high costs we just talked about, $1.7 trillion, misses the mark based on the analysis that just came out. Just as the prices for everyday goods and services are going up, the estimates we're seeing for the true cost of Build Back Better are increasing every analysis we see. These studies have shown us that because the legislation sunsets programs, that if you actually assume those programs are not going to be stopped after, let's say, with the child tax credit one year or two years or three years, but you continue through the life of the legislation, it's going to be much more expensive. And so people tell me, well, Rob, that's fine, but the child tax credit, as an example, only costs $185 billion only. And I say, well, actually, if you take it out over time, that becomes uh, trillions of dollars, like $1.6, $1 $1.7 trillion. And they say, well, we're just going to do it for one year. Well, that's just not what happens here in Congress. I mean, the, the history of this is that once we put a program like that in place, it continues to live on year after year. Let me give you the best example of that. You have probably heard a lot of Democrats saying uh, over the past few weeks, we have to pass this Build Back Better legislation by the end of this year. Why? Because the child tax credit that's already in law based on the March legislation is expiring. 
So there's a tremendous amount of pressure, right? They're saying you have to extend it. Well, that makes our case. So you have to extend it this year? That means, I assume, you have to extend it next year, and the next year, and the next year, and the next year. Um, and uh, anybody who says that they don't want to extend it uh, on the other side of the aisle, I'd, I'd like to hear from them, because I don't think they're going to say that. And so if you assume it's extended, then you have this huge cost. The spending is going to continue to increase, and the program's not going to sunset. The total cost of the bill goes from $1.7 trillion we talked about to about $4.5 trillion based on the Penn-Wharton study I talked about. Under the Congressional Budget Office analysis, it actually goes even higher, even higher to $4.9 trillion. And when you add interest on the debt, it goes actually over $5 trillion. So it's difficult to understand these, these numbers we're talking about because they're so huge. You know, $4.5 trillion is $4,500 billion. Um, we, we've never spent this kind of money before. I mean, if it's $5 trillion, that's the size of our budget or less, the whole budget for the entire country for a year in one bill. Now, people say, well, it's paid for. Well, it, it's uh, the 1.7 part, you could argue, is paid for, although we can talk about that, too, because some of the things in the pay-fors are not sustainable, in my view, including, again, the impact on pension funds or the impact on being able to write off investments or the impact of the, uh, of the SALT issue. Um, so there's lots of things that need to be worked out on the spending side, but also on the revenue side. But let's assume it's $1.7 trillion, but that's not going to cover it because you've got these expenses like the child tax credit that will continue. So I'm glad that my colleague, Senator Lindsey Graham, who's ranking member of the Budget Committee, top Republican, and Senator John Cornyn, another colleague, asked the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office to do their analysis uh, because they showed that without the sunset, the 10-year cost of the child tax credit goes from $185 billion to $1.6 trillion. They also found that in line with another study by the nonpartisan Joint Committee on Taxation, that the revenue loss would be $1.6 trillion, either taking us further into debt by $1.6 trillion or requiring new tax hikes. So that's just one part of the legislation. It would be the costliest expenditure by Congress in our history, but it's just one part of the legislation. The hundreds of billions in funding Democrats are proposing as an example for child care under a new approach to child care, which we can also talk about the substance of that, but it's going to hurt a lot of our states um, the way they're doing it. But that'll end up costing double the written amount over the next decade if they remain in place, for example. So all in all, the Congressional Budget Office looked at 18 supposedly sunset social spending programs and found that it, they will end up costing the taxpayers nearly $3.5 trillion over the next decade when they get extended if they do. And again, the history around here is that they would. So, you know, it's just the price tag goes up and up and up. When you add that spending to another program um, in Build Back Better, CBO says the total spending in the legislation goes again to $4.9 trillion. By the way, $4.9 trillion is bigger than the economy of any country in the world, with the exception of the U.S., China, and Japan. Again, these numbers are just astronomical, but think about that. It's bigger than the entire economy, the entire GDP of any country in the world except for the three of us, United States, China, and Japan. We're seeing record debts and record deficits right now, as you know. The Congressional Budget Office says that the American people can expect Build Back Better if the sun sets don't hold to add another $3 trillion to the federal deficit. So as we continue to debate this in Congress, which way should we go? We just ought to know these numbers. We ought to analyze them. And again, if people on the other side of the aisle are going to say we don't want to have the child tax credit be extended, we need, to, we need to know that. But my sense is just as they want to extend it right now, they would want to extend it next year and the next year and the next year. So is this the right time to do that? Is this the right time to add that kind of stimulus to an economy that already is overstimulated, where you've got more demand chasing not enough supply, do you want to add more to the demand side? That's what's going to happen if we pass this. So I hope that we will not make that mistake. I hope that we will slow down. 
and look at these numbers and analyze where we are in terms of our spending, um, we just extended the debt limit. Uh, no Republican voted for it, but all the Democrats voted for it, and that's all they needed to be able to extend the debt limit because it was under a special 50-vote margin. That debt limit was just extended for basically one year, so after the elections next year. Two and a half trillion dollars more debt. We had to make room for two and a half trillion dollars more debt in one year. Um, it's clear that a lot of Americans are nervous about this. When you look at the polling data, it says that, but just talking to people. Over the weekend, I was also in southeast Ohio, uh, part of our state that's very rural. Uh, a lot of people are, are hurting in terms of the economy because they don't have access to broadband and so on. So um, they're talking about how they feel about the economy, and there's a lot of nervousness. They feel the surging inflation. They're paying more for everything. And, you know, common sense, people are saying, let's just slow down and think about this. They may end up thinking at the end of the day they're, they're for some of this, but they don't want to move forward precipitously and, and make a mistake and, and have this add more inflation and more problems for our debt and deficit for our kids and grandkids. They're saying, let's do the right thing for the country and put the brakes on this. And if we do put the brakes on this unprecedented spending and taxing, it will help us to avoid some of these economic challenges that we're otherwise going to be facing. If we go ahead with it, it's going to make these economic challenges, like inflation, even worse. So my hope is that we'll put the brakes on and these economic challenges will not worsen. And instead, we can get the country back on the right track. I yield the floor.